So uh, welcome to the uh, M-Cubed weekly seminar. Today our speaker is uh, Shunan Wu. Uh, Shun, uh, he's a postdoctoral research uh, scientist at the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, his research uh, centers on uh, understanding the intensifying dynamics of tropical cyclones and the development process of tropical uh, convective systems. Uh, he specializes in utilizing satellite measurements to identify key per precursors of the evolving processes and uh, adopting uh, numerical models to investigate critical physical mechanisms for system developments. And I'd say you know, we've, today's a good time to think about the tropics. I understand we've hit a record for the day here at minus what? F nine? Minus nine. Minus nine. So we broke the record for this day. And so uh, let's all sort of put ourselves in a tropical state of mind and welcome to Can I ask a quick question? For the question, so. <laughs> Uh, tropics, yeah, clouds is uh, part of tropical cyclones, and tropical cyclones includes the fluid dynamics and also the moist convection clouds. So yeah, it's like a chicken and egg question. So it's, it's hard to differentiate the clouds outside from the tropical cyclone, but yeah. So anyway, today we are going to talk about uh, the, <laughs> the role of radiation and clouds in uh, accelerating tropical cyclone genesis. And this work is done with my PhD advisor, Brian Soden, and also cooperate with Dave Nolan and Gus Alaka. So first of all, we can break this title into uh, pick up a few different keywords. The first one is uh, TC Genesis. And in the past decades, uh, there has been a significant improvement in terms of the in, um, predicting TC intensification or TC track. However, if we are talking about predict, predict skills of TC genesis, it seems to be relatively limited. So that's why in this, even in uh, uh, today's talk, we are going to talk about TC intensification and genesis, but on the title, that's why we focus on TC genesis. And the second is radiation. And for radiation, we all know it's the main energy modulator uh, for the Earth systems. If we just have the radiative balance, we can roughly estimate the surface temperature. And if we have radiation and convection, we can kind of simulate the large scale circulation. So radiation is very important and we want to examine what's the role of it to TC genesis. And the third one is clouds. So clouds, <laughs> it's a part of the tropical cyclone. And we all know it can heavily modulate the radiation uh, distribution and balance within the atmosphere. And that's why we also pay attention to clouds. Though, although our title today is the radiation, but actually at the beginning of this work, we took an opposite approach. Conventionally, people tend to think latent heating is the main energy source for tropical cyclone intensification. And when the latent heating is released within within an uh, area with high energy transforming efficiency, tropical cyclones can utilize this latent, heating, latent heat energy more efficiently and transform this energy into kinetic energy. However, there's no conventional way we can actually measure the latent heating within the tropical cyclone. We don't want to steer the boat into tropical cyclone. We don't also yeah, so that's why it's, it's, it's kind of impossible to measure latent heating within, that, uh, within the tropic cycle. And so we were thinking maybe we can use the cloud ice serve as a proxy for latent heat release within the tropic cycle. Because when there's a latent heat release, it always accompanied with uh, uh, condensations. And why we choose cloud ice, frozen hydrometeors, is because these frozen hydrometeors tend to occur around the warm covers level. So here, first of all, we use uh, the observation of cloud ice water content from cloud set. And the cloud set was a part of the atrium constellations. And 
uh, there is the cloud profi profiling radars mounted on the cloud set. It provides a high vertical resolutions of hydrometers, including ice and liquid. So here is an example of the cloud set overpass that scan through Typhoon Chowang. And here you can see overall it can uh, depict the general distribution of cloud ice. And if you look into the center of it, you can see there's a very detailed IO structures. So what we did is we used the cloud set of a pass from 2008 to 15 and differentiated those overpasses into intensifying and weakening TCs based on the TC intensity change within the next 24 hours. So the, up, uh, the figure in the up panel here shows the composites of cloud ice water content for intensifying TC. The mid one is for weakening TC. The x-axis is the axial distance to the zero point because those cloud set overpasses barely hit through TC center. So that's why we use the zero point, which is the point on the overpass that is, has the shortest distance to a TC center and identify it as a zero point here. So here, the x-axis is not the radial distance. It is the axial distance to a zero point, which has the shortest distance to a TC center. And the y-axis is just height in kilometer. And sh uh, shadings here shows the uh, cloud ice water content in milligram per meter cube. And you can see uh, for both intensifying and, and weakening TCs, there is more uh, cloud ice water content concentrated within 100 kilometer of the uh, zero point. And if we further uh, compute their differences by intensifying minus weakened TCs, you can see overall intensifying TCs has, much, uh, has more ice water content compared to weakened TCs. And people, uh, people might argue that my, it, it might because you have more uh, stronger TC intensity within the intensifying composites, and that's why it makes a difference. So the next, uh, in, in order to exclu exclude this factor, what we did here is, is to do the um, partial regressions on the TC intensity and the intensification rate, trying to exclude the factors in, from the TC intensity itself. So the shading shows here is the factor B, which is for T intensification rate here. And the positive um, values occurs within a hung, uh, uh, within, especially within 100 kilometer of the zero uh, point. So it, it shows, yes, we do see a signature of TC intensification in cloud ice water content. And uh, actually, if we see uh, this overall positive values here and in the last slide here, you can see this uh, enhancement is not only limited within 100 kilometer of a zero point. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Thanks, Rich. How many cases are you talking about here? Um, so yes, here, uh, the numbers here is the case. So for so intense line, it's overpasses? about 500. 500 overpasses, okay. yes. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, I should introduce that. And actually, you can see this overall enhancement is not only limited within 100 kilometer, where we were talking about high transforming efficiency area. So maybe this overall enhancement of ice water content may not, may not only be the signal of TC intensification, rather it is the cause for TC intensification in which this uh, cloud ice can interact with the radiation and provide the extra feedbacks for TC to develop in the future. And here I just uh, shows the general uh, horizontal distribution of the cloud ice. So shadings here shows the cloud ice water path. And you can see even in the weakest uh, category, tropical depression, the distribution of cloud ice can extend up to 400 or 500 kilometers of the TC center. So when we are talking about the cloud radiation interactions, what do we refer to in this work? So when there's no clouds, it's clear sky. We have uh, all the 
uh, long wave radiation will just emit out, uh, outgoing and without any object absorb it or stop it. And when we have a cloud pre presence here, these clouds can absorb this outgoing long wave radiation and re-emit re downward and hit up the atmospheric column on the line. And this uh, radiative heating cost because of the presence of cloud, uh, here we defined it as a cloud radiative heating in this work. So the contrast between the cloudy area and uh, non-cloudy area, we have the radiative heating gradient here, and this might uh, induce the uh, secondary circulations that interact with the system over there and then make the system to develop in the future. So first of all, we just have a glance of a peak using the same data set from CloudSat. It also has the cloud radio heating. And in here, we perform a similar analysis, separating the overpasses into those will intensify in the uh, next 24 hours or those will be weakening in the next 24 hours. And the red line is for intensifying TC. Blue lines is for weakening TC. And y-axis here is uh, the cloud radiative heating. And as you can see, intensifying TCs tend to have a stronger cloud radiative heating compared to the blue line, which is for weakening TCs. And this is consistent except for a major TC, which don't have a clear signal of it. This is great. We saw uh, the signal of TC intensification in cloud radio heating. But uh, the uh, retrievals of radiations in cloud set, data set is mainly based on the radiative transfer model. It barely, except for the hydrometeors, it doesn't have uh, observational uh, data or inside of it. So we want to use another data set that contains more, uh, have more observational evidence within it. And except for that, there are, uh, in re recently there are more uh, studies that is studying, that is re uh, doing the research regarding the cloud radiation interactions and, uh, and their relationship with convective aggregation. So previous studies, when they, they just run the simple RC, radiative convective equilibrium models without any uh, force, external forcing. And in a couple, uh, few days, there, was, there will be uh, some convections pop out randomly. But ag after a couple of days, or uh, 60 to 80 days, these uh, pop up uh, random convections start to move to um, clump together eventually and formed one large convective systems. And they, they suggest that it is because of the clouds and radiation interactions that triggers this convective aggregation. And not only used in a convective aggregation, recently there are also a lot uh, numerical studies have trying to investigate the, radiative, the influence of radiative heating on TC evolutions, either in the idealized simulations or a realistic case studies. So our objective here is trying, first is trying to find the observational evidence of how cloud radiative effect is related to TC genesis and its intensification. A second is we want to examine the influence of car radiative uh, effect on TC development using a uh, more uh, a set of idealized simulations. But we, except for the idealized configurations, we also add a realistic environmental effect such as vertical wind shear inside of idealized simulations. And last, uh, third is we also want to inspect uh, the impact of the simulate long wave radiation on the prediction scales in the operational hurricane forecasting model H wolf. So we'll start it from if we can find the observational evidence of the TC intensification or TC genesis in the radiative heating. 
So here we use the series measurement. And series is cloud and earth radiant energy system, which provides a continuous, uh, 20 years continuous data of radiation in the past. And what we did here is trying to locate, so uh, trying to locate the TC or tropical disturbances on the map, pull them out and make a composite based on based on they are going to develop or not develop in the future. So here, uh, the figure on the left is the composite of cloud radiative heating for non-developing tropical disturbances. And uh, uh, the figure on the left is for developing disturbances. And uh, the criteria to differentiate developing or non-developing is if a t tropical disturbances, TD, reaches its TC intensity category in the following 24 hours. So as you can see, in both non-developing and developing cases, uh, most of them have a stronger cloud radio heating within the TC area or within the circulation area because it's it is still under the stage of tropical disturbances. Then we further look into their differences, use developing minus non-developing. And you can see the uh, generally developing tropical disturbances tend to have greater cloud radiative heating within five degree latitude and longitude of the circulation center. And I will just point out directly, you can see that there's a clear cloud radiative heating contrast between the uh, TD area and its environment, uh, similar to the figures to the right, uh, to the left here. So as you can see, there's, if we compare the developing to non-developing tropical disturbances uh, in the circulation area, it tends to have much stronger cloud radiative heating while in the environment, it is opposite. It is actually the non-developing one has stronger cloud radiative heating. And here, we calculated the average of cloud radiative heating within the circulation area and within the environment. And, make, and so the red bars here represent the average within the TD area and the blue bars are for the environment. And the arrow bars represent the stand area of our entire uh, data samples. And here you can see, compared to, uh, compare the TD area, it has the positive cloud radiative heating compared to, uh, relative to the environment area. Let's suggest, uh, if we compare developing to non-developing, in, within the circulation center, developing uh, TDs tend to have stronger cloud radiative heating within its circulation area. And this is based on the 24 hours uh, lead times. So if we push this 24 hours up to five days, which is 120 hours, you can see actually this, uh, the, the gradient of cloud radiative heating between the TD area and the environment still exists except after three days, this signal starts to decrease. So to understand why or how radiative heating kicks into this air, uh, the development of tropical cyclones, here we use the more static energy to uh, try to calculate the um, MSE budget within the tropical cyclones. So in the previous studies, they suggest uh, when the variance of column integrate uh, more static and then increases, uh, look, we can also see the convective systems also aggregates. So here we will also use the similar concept. We will just calculate and uh, compute the uh, budget for more static energy variance. And here, the term on the, the second term on the right is a contribution from the radiation to the increase of this variance of column interest more static energy. And I'll just skip this one. So here is a result uh, for the contribution from radiation to the TC evolutions. 
And overall, in both non-developing and de developing TDs, tropical disturbances, you can see actually feedbacks are all positive. And positive feedbacks occurs throughout the entire composite. But if we compute their differences, you can see actually the developing TDs also have stronger feedbacks within five degree latitude and longitude of a circulation center. And this positive values means they have positive feedbacks. So if we have a moisture or higher moist static energy within this area, a, the radiation would also be larger. And larger radiation can excite the stronger or higher moist static energy within that area too. And you can see this feedback occurs to be stronger within the circulation center. And again, if we ex extend our lead time from 24 hours up to five days, you can see at least up to three days, we can still see this clear uh, signal in the feedbacks between moist static energy and radiation within the circulation. So for the first part, we know developing tropical disturbances tend to have greater cloud rate of heating within the circulation area compared to non-developing tropical disturbances. And on top of that, we also found stronger moist static energy and radiation feedbacks occur in developing tropical disturbances within the convective or circulation area. Now we know there's, we found there's a signal of these intensifications in radiative heating from the observational uh, data. Next, we want to examine the influence of cloud rate of heating on this TC development. So what we did here is, is we adopt the WOLF version 3.9.1 and horizontal resolution here is six kilometer. It's very coarse, I know, but the reason why we use this six kilometer is because we don't want to use the nested domain. We don't want to complicate the interactions within the TC and its outer uh, environment. So we set the uh, entire simulation domain for 3000 by 3000 horizontally. And we just uh, trying to save some computational resources. So that's why we choose a six kilometer. But at least it's the convective permitting uh, uh, resolution. And the vertical level here, uh, we have 60 vertical layers. And radiative skin we used in the simulation is RTMG. And as we mentioned before, we want to, instead of idealized simulations, we want to have more realistic uh, environment factors inside our simulations. So we prescribed uh, two different sea surface temperature. On top of that, we also prescribed the different strengths of vertical wind shear. And to maintain consistent vertical wind shear within the simulations, we applied the method called point downscaling method from Nolan 2011. And we also have a different initial vortex intensity for our simulations. And for sensitivity experiment, we have uh, three sets of experiment. The first one is just control simulations. So we have the regular simulations that let the TC-like vortex run freely. The second is no cloud simulations. That means we remove this cloud rate of heating entirely from our simulations. And the third one is instead of remove this cloud of radiative heating out from this drastic method because we kind of take the energy out from the simulations. So instead of doing that, we homogenize this radiative heating and prescribe it to the entire simulation domains. So here, the figure uh, at the bottom left is our simulation result. The black line, uh, the y-axis is the uh, vortex intensity in meter per second. And the y uh, x axis is the simulation time. And as you can see, for a black line, which is for control simulations, it just increased, increased uh, consistently and it experienced the TC genesis around 96 hours of the simulation time. And if we look into the uh, cyan uh, color line, 
which is no cloud radiative heating. We remove cloud radiative heating. And you can see it never experienced the TC genesis throughout its simulations. So even so when we remove cloud radiative heating, we we in, sorry, we inhibit, uh, we prevent TC genesis from happening. And if we look into the magenta line, which is for uh, the simulations, we prescribe homogenized radiative heating profiles. It also doesn't experience TC genesis. So not only we, when we remove the cloud rate heating, we don't have TC genesis, but also when we just remove cloud radiation interactions, we also inhibit TC genesis. Sure. So in the previous slide, you indicated that you started with a vortex. You imposed an initial vortex. Yes. So I, how are you defining genesis then? I mean, you have a, you have a vortex, and so you... It was generated artificially, but you're talking about intensification, I think, is what you mean, not, not genesis. Yes, so for a vortex here, how we prescribe it is kind of different from, it is the vortex, but the structure of it is different from the real TC structure. So, uh, and the, uh, the definition of the TC genesis here is actually we just use the TC intensity, which is the meter per second, the uh, azimuthal mean of the maximum wind as the standard to differentiate it. But you are right. So here, our vortex is very large. Our Vmax is around like 200 kilometer. It's not like within like 50 kilometer as the like really TC-like vortex. I mean, I, I'm not sure, does that answer your question? Yeah, all right. In, in two cases, it doesn't intensify what is, uh, you're looking at intensification. Yes. Not genesis. No, yeah. Mm. It depends on, so I just talked with Rich about what's the definition of genesis. So here, uh, I guess my definition of genesis is just if the TC intensity exceeds 80 meter per second. But yes, you are correct maybe we need to come up with a better definition for TC genesis. For example, one core, if that actually formed or not. Yeah. So, uh, so this is just one set of the ensemble simulations. And here, uh, what I showed is use the different in a magnitude of vertical wind shear with the different initial uh, vortex intensity and also with different sea surface temperature. And the number shows here, or the word here, is the time, uh, the simulation relative to the control simulations. So for example, for the, uh, for the first one, at the top left one, delay 50, uh, 57 hours means in the homogenized simulations, the TC genesis or the TC intensity reached the 80 meter per second is 57 hours later than the control simulations. So once we homogenized our radiative heating within the simulation domains, we either delayed the TC genesis to occur, oh sorry, we either delayed the time of TC genesis or we even prevent TC genesis from happening. Yeah. So next, we want to see why this happens or we want to see if we can possibly use some uh, physical processes to explain why this happened. So the figure on the left is the column integrated moist static energy variance, the evolution uh, from zero simulation time zero to time six, uh, day six. And the black lines for control simulations and dot green lines are for homogenized simulation. And as you can see, both of them increase along with time, but uh, the control simulations uh, increases faster than the homogenized simulation. And the middle one is the contribution uh, from surface enthalpy flux to the, uh, in to the increase of column integrated moist static energy variance. And the right figure shows the contribution from the radiation. And because we homogenize the radiation within our simulations, so there won't be any contributions from the homogenized sim simulation. 
And um, I would like to draw your attention to the time when these two sets of simulations start to diverge. So if we look into the variance, the time they start to diverge is around day two. And for the contribution from surface enth enthalpy flux, they start to diverge from day three. So it is already one day later than the column integrated moist static energy variance. But for net radiation flux, you can see the clear uh, divergence occurs just within day one. So we, we hypothesize it's because this uh, st more uh, stronger contribution from the radiation within the control simulations that really uh, differentiates the evolutions within the control simulations and homogenized simulations. So based on the idealized simulations, we understand that preventing cloud radiation feedbacks from happening, we can inhibit the, or delay TC genesis. And also radiative heating is one of the main energy provider at the early stage of a TC development. Let me go back a little bit, sorry, I forgot to mention. So actually, if you look into the contribution from surface and surface flux, and the net radiative flux, you can see uh, after day four, uh, surface enthalpy, the contribution from surface enthalpy flux becomes uh, much greater. So that's why here, uh, when I write this conclusion, I emphasize at the early stage of TC development. And here, uh, so now, after we find the observational evidence of uh, TC intensification in radiative heating, we also examine the influence of cloud radiative heating on the TC development. Next, we want to see, uh, is it possible we can uh, find uh, uh, how the long wave radiation or radiation, how the radiation impacts the prediction skills in the, upper, in the operational hurricane forecasting model? So what we want to do is, what we did here is we used the Basin Scale H-Wolf 2018 retrospective simulations, and we used these H-Wolf simulations compare the simulated radiative heating within H-Wolf to the observation series, and to see how well the H-Wolf did in replicate that uh, simulated radi radiation. And also, at the same time, we compare the TC intensification prediction scales within the hurricane, uh, H wolf to the actual uh, TC intensification. So here uh, we use uh, entire about 500 simulation cycles, and for each simulation cycles, we only choose the simulation time frame from six to 30 hours because when there's a longer simulations later, it might have a larger errors. So that's why we only limit it within 30 hours. And the variables we will check here, instead of cloud radiative heating, we use the atmospheric long wave radiation convergence. So which is very simple, just the long wave radiative heating within the atmospheric column, that's it. <laughs> and to compare with the model simulations, we select the same storm at the same time from series me measurements to compare with the H12 simulations. So first of all, uh, here I show the uh, long wave radiation convergence from the series measurement. The left column shows the composite for weakening TCs. The mid column is for intensifying TCs. And different rows represent different intensity categories. And as you can see, uh, both weakening and intensifying TCs have stronger long wave radiation convergence within the circulation or uh, TC area. And if we further in look into their differences, which is intensifying minus weakening, we can see intensifying TCs tend to have stronger long wave radiation convergence compared with the weakened TCs. So here, we perform the same analysis, but for the H12 simulations. So it's the same uh, configuration. Uh, the left 
uh, column for weakening, mid column for intensifying, and right column for their differences. And you can see generally H12 can capture the distribution of long wave radiation convergence, but their magnitude is uh, 20, uh, about 5 to 10 percent different from the series measurement. But overall, they can capture the distribution and they can also capture the signal of TC intensification in the radiative heating. So next, except for look into just TC intensification, we also look into the intensification rate. So the figure, the, the here we shows the uh, long wave convergence from series measurement. The left one is the average for all the, all the case we have. And to the right three are the differences between different in, uh, intensification rate and the average. So here you can see as we progress from slow, fast, and rapid intensifying TCs, the uh, there's also stronger cloud, uh, sorry, stronger long wave radiation convergence occurs within the TC area. So we repeat the same analysis for H wolf. Here again, we see uh, H wolf pretty much replicate the similar stuff. So as we have, as the TCs have a uh, faster intensification rate, it also has the stronger cloud rate, oh, sorry, stronger radiation convergence within the M3 column in the TC area. So this is, uh, so now we know HWOLF can uh, properly replicate the distribution of radiation. It can properly replicate uh, TC intensification signal. And what if, so how does radiation impact the prediction skills in H-Wolf? So here, the left column is uh, from series. The mid columns and the right columns are all for H-Wolf, are all from H-Wolf simulations. But instead, we separate H-Wolf simulations into those correctly capture TC intensification in the next 24 hours. And those fails to capture the TC intensification in the next 24 hours. And as you can see, for H wolf that captures the TC intensification in the future, it demonstrates the same signal of TC intensification as what we saw in series measurement. But for those that fails to, it doesn't capture this signal. And we want to, this looks very interesting, so we want to advance one more step, trying to look into the radial distribution of radio heating error versus the intensification error. So here we have three lines, which represents three different intensification error. From the blue is for zero to 10 knots, and uh, the orange is for 20 to uh, 10 to 20 knots. And the green one has the largest intensification error from 20 to, uh, to 30 knots. And as you can see, when, uh, if we look into this green line, which has the largest intensification error, it also has the largest uh, initial long wave radiation error around the TC area compared to the rest of the two, which has smaller intensification error. So let, so uh, according uh, to the comparison between actual simulations to series measurement, we know that H, uh, correctly capturing the radiation distribution might be able to increase the prediction skills of TC intensification. And so uh, through a series of analysis, we found that actually the gradient of radiative heating is the major factor that impact TC genesis in our analysis. So it is the gradient of radiative heating within the TC area or circulation area and the environment. So we were thinking, 
what else can impact the radiative heating distribution. So actually, this, so here it is the column integrated relative, relative humidity uh, uh, from the snapshot of the simulations. And you can see uh, within the TC area, there's a much higher moisture within TC. But for environment, it is much uh, less compared to the TC area. So, and also water vapor is a, a major uh, modulator for radiation. So we were thinking if we change the moisture in the environment, does that modulate or redistribute the radiative heating in the simulations? So how we test it is we uh, configure the simulations similar to we introduced before, uh, 3,000 kilometers wide of horizontal uh, domain, and we modify the environmental moisture in the simulations only, only within radiative skin and examine the evolution of this TC-like vortex. So we only modify the uh, moisture within this blue area in the radiative skin. We don't touch anything in the microphysics schemes. So it is only the radiative impact from moisture to TC evolution. And here we also prescribed different initial uh, vortex intensity, and we also have the different environmental moisture from the weight. Uh, from uh, we have a control simulations, and the weightiest one is uh, eighty percent, down to five percent of red humidity. So here we first show one set of simulations with different environmental moisture, and. Uh, this, shows, this figure shows the evolution of TC intensity from time zero to simulation time six. And as you can see, TC is with moisture environment, which is the red and yellow lines uh, uh, intensifies faster compared to the TC with or a vortex with a drier environment, which is blue and uh, purple lines. So this is very interesting because we only modify the moisture within the radiation scheme. So, and maybe you think, uh, maybe it's just biased because of this set of simulations. So I will show you the, uh, the extra, the next two simulations with different initial vortex intensity. And so different groups, uh, so if you look into the bar graphs here, different groups represent different initial vortex intensity. And bars with different colors shows uh, different uh, environmental moisture. And as you can see, within different groups, when we progress from dry to wet uh, environmental moisture, the days that take to uh, reach the TC, uh, TC intensity category decreases. That means the moisture, when we prescribe moisture air in the environment, it takes less time to reach the TC intensity category. And except for the uh, TC genesis, the time that takes to TC genesis, we also want to see if this uh, modification also affects the intensification rate after genesis. So here it is the similar configurations. Uh, the figure on the left shows the hours that takes for TC from Genesis to Cat 1 hurricane. And you can see generally it still shows a pattern when we are in, when the vortex is in a moisture environment, it tends to take less time to uh, reach the category one hurricanes. But if we look into the figure on the right, which is the hours that need to take from TC Genesis to category three hurricanes, this doesn't appear to me have a, a significant difference between each uh, sensitivity experiment. So this uh, the result again suggests us the radiative, uh, the radiative heating influence or the radiative influence of environmental relative humidity on TC intensification rate can influence 
the weaker TCs, but for TCs that is already being strong enough, it has much less impact on those strong TCs. And here is we're trying to look why this happens, why we only prescribe different environmental moisture and this diverge, diverging evolution happens. And so we compute the column integrated rate of heating and, and here for the TC area and the environment. So the y-axis axis here is actually the differences of uh, column integrated rate of heating between TC area and the environment. So we mentioned the gradient of radiative heating between TC area and the environment is crucial for TC intensification. So the bigger, the better for TC to intensify. And as you can see, the red line here is the simulations with the larger, with the moist, most moist uh, environment. And it also has the largest gradient in column integrated radiative heating between TC area and the environment. So next here, uh, here I shows the cross sections, uh, azim sorry, azimuthal mean of the uh, simulations. So the x axis is the radius to the TC center. The y axis is the height in kilometer. And the shadings here is the radiative heating. And uh, arrows shows the secondary circulation. Only the first, the top, panel shows the radiative heating, uh, absolute, absolute value of radiative heating. The rest of all at, uh, below shows the differences between uh, the, the moisture uh, sensitivity experiment and the environment, uh, the, sorry, the sensitivity experiment with only 5% simulation. So again, as we progress from dry to a uh, moisture environment, we can see this uh, there's a stronger radiative heating occurs within 400 kilometer of the radius. And this transverse circulation also becomes greater because of these differences. And currently for this set of simulations, what we did is only prescribed for the entire troposphere. And uh, one thing that looks very interesting, this is only a preliminary result, but we think it would be interesting to look into how about we just prescribe the different moisture in the environment only within the boundary layer or the free troposphere. And what's the main modulator for what we just see? And as you can see, if we prescribed the uh, different environmental moisture, within the boundary layer, it shows the exactly the same result as we prescribed for the entire troposphere. But for a free troposphere, it shows an absolute result. So this is very interesting to see, and we are still like, looking into why this happens. Yeah. And last but not least is, I kind of want to say why I'm at NCAR to visit. It's because of the NASA field campaign, CPEC-CV. So uh, in the last year, September, NASA have, have the, has the field campaign over uh, West Africa coast uh, on the island called uh, Sao, which belongs to the country Cap, Cap Verde. And Rosie and Kelly were both on that uh, field campaign too. And for our group, we want to find, uh, our research topic is what are factors contributing to the climatological rainfall maximum just offshore over the West Africa because it is uh, where the African East Wave tend to propagating offshore then develop into the hurricanes later, that tracks the US. And that's why we pay attention to this area. And uh, not only because I want to mention why I'm here, but uh, uh, in the last year, September 27th, Hurricane Ian landed over the U.S. It is the second deadliest storm to strike continental U.S. in this century. And if we rewind a 
time back about two weeks ago. Actually, it was the time we were in Cap Verde. So this is the forecasting. You see for the Hurricane Ian, it was just the African East Way propagating offshore from West Africa. And we actually flew through that uh, African East wave. So this is the flight track overlay with the precipitation from IMERGE. And both uh, Rosie and Katie are, were on that flight and also playing the track for that flight. And so if you, so I feel this is very interesting to see because you, if you, we look into this uh, precipitation map, actually this African EC wave is expansive. It's very huge. And none of the predictions pick up it will become the hurricane later, last track the US. So I'm looking forward to looking into these data and trying to examine if there's very interesting uh, signal or mechanisms within these simulations. Yeah. And uh, just to summarize, uh, from, today's, uh, from this work, we know radiative heating plays a critical role in influencing TC intensification and genesis. And the better from the H wolf simulations, we know that the better representation of the radiation can also have the better prediction skills of TC intensification. And last but not least, the radiative impact of moisture might be able to jumpstart the weak TC-like vortex. And thank you for your attention. Questions, comments. So who is up first? Maybe Jennifer. Um, some clarification. You mentioned that um, the uh, heating. What depth um, were you talking about for the net heating of the hurricane? Because I noticed that above the hurricane, there's a strong cooling, and there's strong heating within the clouds, within the hurricane itself. Now, did you refer to this one or? Yeah, I was referring to this one right here. Yeah, so when we talk about the radiative heating, actually in the atmosphere, it's mostly cooling. So what we want to say here is the relative, uh, it's the another's radiative heating. Okay. And here, when we talk about the radiative heating, we tend to refer to the levels below 10 kilometers. Okay. Because that's where the warm core of TCs usually occurs, and that would be better for TC to, to develop. Okay, thank you. And then another question. You mentioned the total radiate, net radiative heating, but then you uh, went to the long wave. Yes. Um, what's the relative magnitude of those two? Is the long wave more important? So it's very, very interesting question because before I did this analysis, I was thinking about radi uh, short wave radiation is also huge in terms of magnitude, but actually for clouds, it's, uh, if we plot out the cloud radiative heating in short wave, it is one magnitude, one order smaller than the long wave radiation. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank yeah. you. Very interesting. Thank you. Great work, Shannon. Um, I think it's really interesting. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one with your uh, previous work, you find that, I think it, it, it relates to your first conclusion, um, greater radiative heating helps the developers. Yes. And I'm wondering if you have related that to the uh, type of, of convective system. Um, and so bottom heavy versus top heavy this is a very good question. I haven't actually thought about uh, bottom heavy or top heavy where the radiative heating occurs would benefit more for TC genesis. And I, so in, if we simply just look from the cloud perspective, actually the frozen hydrometeors have much more stronger impact than uh, liquid hydrometeors. And the frozen hydrometeors tend to occur in, I would say, more at the upper level, mid to upper level. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And then the second question I had was more related to your uh, latest work. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, myself, I'm doing moisture perturbation experiments, and my conclusions uh, relate more to your um, moistening the boundary layer where the more moist stimulations tend to be, um, they get there, they get to the genesis, but they have a weaker genesis. Yes. And so I know you related gradative, uh, gradient radiative heating to moisture, mm -hmm. but I think there's something to say about the environment being too moist and not having a moisture gradient. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that's very interesting because uh, the reason why we only modify the moisture within the environment is because it's very hard for realistically to modulate the moisture within the TC. So that's why. And if and also here, we don't uh, make any modifications in the microphysics pins. So I guess it would be have a much stronger impact if we, we try to perturb or modulate uh, moisture within the microphysics schemes. And for sure, a moisture environment can excite more convections in the environment and that might kind of deteriorate the TC intensification processes. Yeah. Well, very quick, uh, very nice talk. And I think you touch upon the ice phase a little bit. I'm just mm -hmm. curious, because when you, at the beginning, you mentioned the ice phase, or you also mentioned uh, the indication of the operational models. I'm mm -hmm. curious, uh, based on your work, uh, how important that microphysical uh, physics itself and the operational model will play the role and how important the accurate kind of uh, description of the environment condition or vapor distribution to the uh, predictability of your uh, hurricane development yeah. will be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, so for the microphysics schemes, I would say it's extremely important because in wolf simulations, uh, we also perform another simulations just with different microphysics schemes. The distribution of cloud ice water content changes where the maximum level it occurs or the overall distribution or just the magnitude, it changes a lot. And also, so I would say microphysics schemes is very important. And also in the radiative schemes, Frozen hydrometeors is also very important. So that not so microphysics schemes not only impact the distribution of latent heating, it also impacts the radiative distribution of red latent heating. And in terms of the moisture influence on, on the prediction skills, this is the question I never thought about. But I think it would be very interesting because typically when we have uh, systems that is going to uh, propagate from Eastern Atlantic to Western Atlantic, sometimes it has the dry air intrusion get into the those African East waves. So I'm not sure about how large this is effect is, but it would be very interesting to further look into it because there's actually a lot of dry air intrusions into those systems that tend to develop in the future. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one more uh, question from Slido. Uh, it's from Jimmy Dudia. You showed preceding ALCW errors were related to H wharf success. Oh, thank you. There it is. But could uh, that just be a lack of preceding high clouds? So it was already not convective when it failed. Counter hypothesis. <laughs> that's that's very possible. Like I mentioned before, uh, the question asked: Microphysics schemes not only influence the distribution of radiant heating; it also influence the impact of the distribution of radiative heating. So, I I I would say that's possibly true. But what we want to demonstrate here is if you don't have the correct radiative heating distributions, you probably don't get the correct predictions 
of TCE intensification. But that's definitely possible. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks again. And thank we'll you. Continue the conversation out in the hall. Thank you.